Good evening, everybody. It's Monday, July 18th, 2022, and this is a regular meeting of Moscow City Council. In rising, if you're able to, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first up tonight is the consent agenda, and this consists of items that are more or less routine and have been previously vetted by the Public Works and Finance Committee or the Administrative Committee and can be removed for further consideration by any member of the council. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Sorry, Gina. It's all right. <laughs> Robert's rules yeah. light. We're good. Uh, moved and seconded. Um, Haley. Aye. Gina. Aye. Julia. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Anne. Aye. And Sandra. Aye. And those are approved. Next item up on the regular agenda is staff recognition report. Staff. We get recognized. Oh. Represented by Tyler Palmer himself. Uh. <laughs> You're looking pretty good with that, though. It's much better. A little better. It's, it's getting a little bit better. All right. This evening, I'm really happy to be here um, to recognize our fleet department. Our fleet department was recognized. Um, Government Fleet Magazine, in conjunction with the American Public Works Association, runs what's called the Leading Fleet Program. And it's, it's, an, it's a national competition for the leading fleets throughout the country. And when you think about it, there are tens of thousands of local government fleets, state government fleets throughout the country. And each year they award somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 100 fleets within this program. And so it's a tiny, tiny percentage of the fleets that gain this recognition. This year in 2022, there were only 88 fleets that were recognized. Um, and one of the things that's a real point of pride is as you read through the list of the entities that are typically recognized. For example, this year, it's New York City, City of Phoenix, City of Houston. Generally, these are the cities that, are, that, are in, that have the resources that are trying to run the fleet department in a very modern and very advanced way. And so it's really a tribute to Carl Whittinger and his staff that they are doing things in a way that is conducive to receiving this kind of award. So we've got Carl here tonight, who is our fleet manager. And so I'll have Carl come up and present him with a certificate that was sent as in recognition of this award. <laughs> I just swivel around. Can you, can you, yeah, so those can backgrounds not good. <laughs> just stop where you are, guys. <laughs> cool. Bravo. Oh, modesty fun. ensues. <laughs> Thanks very much, Carl. Appreciate what you do for the city and keeping us on all our wheels running at the same time. Good work. Next up, the mayor's appointments, and I have two of them up for tonight, both of them for the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission, uh, both expiring 12-31-2024. First one is A.S. Sumner, and the second one is Lisa Meyer. I move approval of the slate of appointments. Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Nope. Julia. Aye. Gina. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Anne. Aye. Sandra. Aye. Haley. Aye. Okay. Are either of our two nominees out there any place? I see A, but a she doesn't have to come a, up if she doesn't want to. <laughs> and her husband's laughing next to her. They should both have to come up. Yeah. If you want to, please come up to the podium and uh, say any remarks if you'd like. We'd appreciate hearing from you. <laughs> we love your T-shirt. That's a good T-shirt. It's a Moscow branding T-shirt. Monday for me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hi. Aya. So I applied to join the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission because I feel like I get asked questions on a daily basis on what's happening with housing and just um, trying to keep tabs on what's happening with the workforce housing development and ARPA funds in Boise. So yeah, anyway. Great. So, Welcome on awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Welcome Aya. to the commission. Thanks for volunteering. 
Is Lisa out there any place? Nope. That's okay. Well, there are openings on some more of the city commissions, and I would encourage anybody who is interested in committing to some public service for the city to look through the commission list and see if there's any that you find appealing or interesting. And please, online, fill out the application form, send it in, and you too might have the privilege of coming to the podium at a meeting like this and uh, telling us what's on your mind and why you joined up. So thanks for that. Okay, next up, public comment in the mayor's response period. And for the next 15 minutes, uh, we're here to hear what's on your mind. And it comes in three minute chunks. So don't waste time with a lot of preamble. Just come up with your name, city of residence. And as long as it's not an item that is before planning and zoning commission or the um, board of adjustment. So go. <laughs> Just pop up to the podium because we need to get you on the microphone and on the record. Hmm? So is this about daycare? Yes. That's coming, that's coming up later. Yeah. Coming <laughs> later up. On. So this but is you general... know the pathway now, and that's yeah. good. <laughs> I got it. So yeah. I'm trying to give you signals, not yet. So yep. So actually I should have said two, not on tonight's agenda <laughs> or planning and zoning or board of adjustment. My omission, sorry. Hi. You're on. Matt, uh, live on Hayes. Have trouble remembering the address, but it's in the <laughs> 600 block. Um, uh, I, I think that I kind of can figure things out, and, and I generally judge myself as at least a regular person. So um, I was like, you know, I'm standing up here. Maybe I should follow the process for getting things changed. And so I looked at the commissions. Um, and by the way, I, I have secure housing. I'm not under the authority of any law enforcement and my breasts are male. So this is about others. Um, so I'm like, all right, so clearly these commissions are a place to start. Um, and uh, so I, 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 went, I went with someone who needed some fair and affordable housing. I met Amy, wonderful person, gave me some great information, um, kind of solved the problem. Uh, so I'm like, I should go look at these commissions. Best I can tell, that commission doesn't do anything. Um, and it certainly doesn't have many things, but but it's it's also frustrating. I don't, they were talking about a topic of interest. I missed the meeting. No minutes, no recordings. Um, there's no minutes yet. So the minutes aren't available to the public until the August meeting. So if it's not canceled, which they tend to cancel all those. Anyway, I, I better get through this three minutes. Um, so so I was like, okay, that's frustrating. I talked to someone on that commission. They're like, don't bother. Um, so I'm like, okay, maybe human rights. Talked to some people been on the commission that that that's been disappointing. Um, they, there were things like these body-worn cameras where, the, as far as I know, I'm a regular person who's looking for it, I can't get the policy for the body-worn cameras. And I'm confident that they don't fit ACL, ACLU guidelines, which was a recommendation by the Fair and Affordable, or by the Human Rights Commission. Uh, it's appalling that you can't access this policy and I hope it's not really true. Um, it certainly couldn't find it on a website. Or, it, so uh, I, I became really frustrated with these commissions. I'm trying not to come to a city council member and talk about the topics of my interests because you're busy. Um, and the city supervisor doesn't seem appropriate. The mayor is, you know, busier than, so uh, I, I guess I, I'm just frustrated with the, with the commissions and frustrated with the plan. I went to planning, uh, planning and zoning, I could watch it. Planning and zoning did more about fair and affordable housing. Um, Haley was there. They did more about fair and affordable housing in a great presentation by Nils Peterson, but nobody from fair and affordable housing was there. Um, and I'm not sure why that same presentation 
isn't shared or something that should be watched by those commission members. It was, he's got a really, him and his organization got a really great thing going. And then they turn around and dig deeper and the planning and zoning is involved in taking away fair and affordable housing. That you pass legislation, which has created a situation with uh, manufactured home, mobile home, the whole Gary Lester mess, which has ended up with fewer people getting in these trailer courts, vacancies, and people who dare not move from where they are because they can't get in the trailer court again. These are good people, old people, people on pensions, retirement, and it, they can't move to a different trailer court in town because they can't fit the quality of people that it's insisted on to be in these fair and affordable houses, which really the... the nope, you got one more minute. Okay. That really the fair and affordable housing thing just made it okay to... Uh, yeah. It, that that's frustrating that the planning and zoning actually was doing something that worked against fair and affordable housing, against human rights, that I couldn't find this camera policy that I told it wasn't available to the public when it should be something public and that matches at least ACLU guidelines instead of a secret that it, it's ripe for abuse and it's definitely frustrating and it's not transparent at all. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to join a commission. Okay. Well, a couple Thanks. of responses here since the mayor has response time. Uh, one, feel free to approach any city councilor with any of your concerns or issues. That's why city council, in fact, the mayor, that's why we're here. Hmm. Uh, if we don't hear from citizens, we don't know what's on your mind. Uh, two, uh, stick around for a little bit because the Human Rights Commission has their annual report coming up here in just a moment. And three, uh, relative to the body cam information and policies, um, we have the chief of police sitting right there who can direct you to the appropriate resource on that. All right. So he's also on the commission that gave through, which is kind of weird that he didn't step aside for that particular. So stuff, but there but. you go. So those are some brief answers, but to go further in depth, yeah. you know, get a hold of one of us, please. All right. Thanks. I have your emails. I'm just trying to work with commissions and website. And, sure. Um, sure. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. You're welcome, Matt. Who else wants to pop up? Hello. Hi. My name's Kent Salisbury. I'm a resident of the city of Moscow. I'm concerned about these trees that were cut down along the new street project on 3rd Street. Uh, there were some older, well-established and valuable tree species. And I don't know if all the proper can't, avenue. Can't, can we have you move just a little closer to the microphone? Right. So we can, thank you. They were some well-established and valuable tree species. They gave a lot of shade. I really enjoyed the trees. There were four that were cut down uh, there with the new project. And uh, I thought that was something that the city promised never to do. So I just want to bring up my concern. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Do we know anything about the fate of the trees? We did have some trees in our current um, pedestrian safety projects on 3rd and 6th that ended up unfortunately needing to be removed. Um, it, we try to avoid whenever we can any tree removal, but there are times when either because of the species and location or because of the surrounding infrastructure or the age and condition of the tree, it sometimes becomes necessary but those are replaced with replacement trees as we go through that process. But but there there were some trees that were causing some sidewalk heaving, mm -hmm. um, didn't have enough room for adequate tree wells for the type of species, um, and then some because of aging condition. In addition to the replacement trees, some additional new trees are also being planted as part of those projects. That's right. right. Yeah. That's correct. So, well, it's one of those tree things where you got to plant the tree and then wait 10, 20 years for the tree to look like a tree so i hate to say it but patience uh, 
anyway, the city's aware, and uh, as Tyler indicates, we do try to avoid unnecessary felling of our urban forest. Anyone else? Okay, on to the next. Next up is the Citizens Commission report for the Human Rights Commission. Uh, James Fry and Ken Fonts. Chief Fry, Mary hello. Council, good evening. Um, I would like to introduce Ken Fonts, who's the chair of the Human Rights Commission. He has a presentation. If we could maybe just get one of the lights dimmed there. Ken? Oh, well introduced. Thank you, Chief. Is it that one? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members, for having me here. And I want to start off that there's a typo on the front page. It should be the 2022 uh, Council report. Uh, I lost a year somewhere in the in COVID. You know, I'll just, I'll just blame it on that um, as part of it all. Let's see this one. I think. Okay. So to start off with. These are our commission members at this time. I just want to give credit to all of them. And our uh, staff liaison, of course, is uh, Chief Fry, and our council liaison is Sandra Kelly. I didn't put them up there, but everybody knows who they are. So, All right, so I want to go through what we've uh, done over the last year, and then what are some upcoming things that we're involved in as we go through here. And this might be a little hard to see. All right, so we held our usual inclusive community month activities in September uh, this uh, last year. And our theme for 2021 was in this together. Uh, and so we picked that theme as a result of everything that had been happening before that in Moscow. And so some of the events that we did, and um, we had a uh, one, uh, our first talk was a conversation on voting rights with Professor Buffington. And so uh, she spoke. She lives in Pullman now. But she um, was active in the civil rights movement in Mississippi. She was a member of SNCC and as a teenager. And so she gave us some firsthand experiences of, from the civil rights movement in the 60s and then compared it to voting rights today, um, what was going on at the time. Then we, uh, our next uh, speaker was uh, Dr. Anthony Stevens with the University of Idaho, and her talk was, Are We in This Together? in uh, search of the, I can hardly read that myself, the common <laughs> ground in education. And so she looked at, uh, are we in this together along with education? Is education inclusive in the country? And so she had a lot of talk on that. And her expertise is in uh, Native American uh, education. And then we closed out the month with the showing of the film Shared Legacies uh, that looked at the African-American and Jewish Civil Rights Coalition, uh, an alliance that was during the Civil Rights Movement that had since broken up and the movement to get the two groups back together and working together. We then had a panel uh, after the, the film. So we showed the film and then it had a panel afterwards as part of it all. And they were all well attended um, and we got some good responses back from those. We also last year did our biannual uh, Ismat and Manan Sheikh Community Unity Award in November 2021. We do it every other year, uh, staggering it with the Arts Commission Award. So our next one will be next year uh, before we do it again. And our winner uh, for the 2021 award was Kathy Sprague for her work, not only with Inland Oasis and all that she does there, but specifically all of the work she did to get the West Side Food Pantry up and running and getting volunteers and getting food in. And it was well needed, uh, very important for the community. And it's a very active food bank now. Um, and so we honored her for all of her work in that. Sadly, at the time, we were having a surge. And so we had to do it with a limited audience and mostly on Zoom, which you know, it's not quite the same thing, but it worked uh, as part of it all. Um, 
We also uh, help sponsor, was a co-sponsor with the University of Idaho Women's Center and several other groups uh, for Women's History Month and uh, Farm Workers Awareness. A speaker, Monica Ramirez, was brought in in March um, of this year. And so we love partnering with other groups because then we can bring in bigger activities and more major speakers because then everybody puts in a little bit of money and we can afford it. So it's much more effective that way. And so we partner this time mainly with the Women's Center, but the Office of Multicultural Affairs and several other groups as well were part of that. We then, uh, for Asian American and Pacific Islander Month, uh, showed the film Bamboo and Bob Wire in May at the Kenworthy, which is on the Milka uh, internment camp. And this was in uh, conjunction with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, Association. And the director uh, came in special for the uh, film and introduced it and then led a panel after the film. And so that was in, uh, very, very successful, uh, highlighting what was going on at the Minidoka camp in uh, southern Idaho. Um, and then just as a side note, while she was here, uh, uh, she is also, Karen Day is also, uh, writes for uh, Idaho Magazine, and they were working on an issue of historic theaters in Idaho, and the Kenworthy was not on the list, and so she came to the Kenworthy, loved it, and made sure it got on the list and was written up in the article, and so how it slipped through, I do not know, but we got it on there, uh, so, because she was amazed, because she didn't even realize it was here, uh, and, and, you know, that it was still a historic theater inside and everything that was part of it all. So that went really well. Um, and then we held Moscow's first Juneteenth celebration in June, and that was very, very well attended, and it was a good start. And Mario Pyle was our speaker. He's the director of the Black and African American Cultural Center at the University of Idaho. And so we're going to be doing Juneteenth event every year from now on, and it's going to grow and expand. So next year, we're already working with some WSU groups. Uh, we're uh, going to have food. We're going to have more entertainment. At this particular one, we had some music. We had some uh, spoken word poetry uh, as part of all of this, but we're going to expand it. And we're talking about how we're going to start tying it together as a Juneteenth of the Palouse. And so there will be events in Pullman and events in Moscow, and we'll tie them all together so people can go back and forth. So we're not competing with each other. And so that's the plan in the future. We also sponsored, along with uh, Moms, Moms Hugs uh, Moscow and Pullman, the Mama Bears film uh, just recently in June. And this uh, is an excellent film. If you have not seen it, you should watch it. It takes a look at uh, parents of LGBT kids and the issues uh, with, you know, protecting their children, uh, get, getting their children thriving and all of that. And so it's, it's an excellent film. It, it makes you angry. It makes you sad. And at the end, it's extremely uplifting at the very end of it. So, you know, it doesn't end on a sad note. It's very uplifting. So it, and that was extremely well attended. The Kenworthy was full on that particular one. All right, other activities that we participated in over the year uh, is uh, we participated in the Great Moscow Food Drive in August of 2021 with the Latah County Human Rights Task Force. We do this every year where we uh, set up um, at the Farmer's Market and at East City Park and collect uh, food and donations. And uh, this was a very good one. Uh, we, you know, they collected... I, can't even remember how many thousands of dollars that were collected in donations for the food banks. Yeah, it was, you know, but quite a bit. a lot more than they ever. Yeah, it was like a record uh, year this last time. And it was extremely needed uh, to uh, fund the, the food banks as well as the uh, Weekend for Food Kids program to provide food for the kids on the weekends during the summer because the school district cannot do that because of the federal grants don't cover it. And so uh, other groups do that, and so it raised money for that. Um, we participated in the Pride Festival again in uh, 2021, and so that was, you know, we 
missed a year of the Pride Festival because of COVID. They held it in, in uh, 2021. And so it was ex not as big as it has been in the past because we're coming back from COVID, but it was still well attended, a lot of vendors and booths. And so that worked out well. We held uh, Indigenous Peoples Day activities uh, what we did on this one, since we were worried about a live event in Friendship Square, what we did instead, we uh, worked with some uh, uh, Native American uh, teachers to put together curriculum for Moscow Public Schools, and on we sent it out to all of the schools, a complete lesson plan that was set up so that the teachers who were very, very busy could just whoops, pull that lesson plan or any part of those lesson plans for Indigenous Peoples Day. And so we did it that, uh, that way because we couldn't do a live event. A lot of people were nervous about the live event, so we decided not to have it. We participated again in the MLK Human Rights Breakfast. Uh, now here's a picture of it. This was not last year's. This is when we could actually meet in person because uh, the one for January 2022 was virtual because people were still uncomfortable <laughs> about meeting in person. And so we did it virtually, but it was still a, a really good turnout and a good speaker as part of it all. Um, we also have did uh, one day at the market uh, this last time in July. And so the Human Rights Commission tables at the market a few times every summer. And uh, last summer was a bit spottier, of course. Uh, we did one in earlier uh, in June uh, as well. Uh, but we, um, and so this one uh, we just did. And so we usually have quite a number of people coming over and talking to us and asking us about things and asking questions and what are we doing. And so and we advertise a lot of upcoming events and so forth at these. We have another one coming up in August. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now, the big thing we started working on is the Moscow Together project. And we started that in March, uh, actually. Uh, and we're still working on it. And council members will be hearing a lot about it soon because we are bringing it before the council. Uh, Mia Batista looked it over uh, the proposal. And so we're partnering with the Moscow Human Rights Commission, the Interfaith uh, Council, um, and we're also on our planning committee already have a couple businesses. The One World and La Casa Lopez have joined us on the planning committee to put this project together. And what it is, just in a nutshell, you'll see the whole final proposal. We do have a final proposal now. Um, and so I'll be getting that through council uh, proceedings here so it gets before you. So we, we're asking for your support on it. But basically, it's uh, bringing together uh, businesses, nonprofits, organizations uh, to make Moscow a more inclusive and welcoming place and that signing onto this. And so the businesses who become members uh, of this put um, decals in their windows and are part of it. But beyond that, we're going to have activities. We're going to do other things with it. And the idea is to make Moscow as welcoming and inclusive as we can, because we like to call us ourselves an inclusive community. And, you know, in the past, the League of Cities have named us the only inclusive city in Idaho. Uh, and, but there are some groups of people that do not feel safe and welcomed in a lot of places. And we want to alleviate that idea because we've heard a lot of uh, things of people thinking of moving here, people thinking to come to college here or to get a job here. And they're like, well, we heard this about you know, Idaho in general, but Moscow, and we want to start alleviating that. And the uh, Chamber of Commerce is uh, looking at supporting us as well. We're going to get other businesses involved. And we've already talked to a number of businesses and that are very supportive of this idea. And so we'll be getting more on that as we go along. All right, other activities that we did throughout the year, we uh, 
put out flyers uh, more than once supporting transgender or transgender residents, posting them uh, on bulletin boards around town. Uh, as you know, we worked with the city council on changing the city uh, public bathrooms to gender neutral. And so you're all well familiar with that particular one. And so we worked on that. Um, we also worked uh, on getting the bias reporting system up and running. And thanks to Chief Fry and Mia Batista for all of their work on that one. And so that we're still trying to get the word out to people uh, that it is all right to call this, that they should, if they're a victim of bias or they witness a bias incident, that they should call in and report it. The uh, You call the non-emergency number of the police department and they have all the codes uh, for all the different kind of bias incidents and it's reported. It goes to uh, not only Chief Fry, but uh, Mia. And then that, you know, gets back to us. And so even if these incidents don't rise to the level of crime, which most of them do not, we know what's happening. We can keep track of it. And many times, if you have a rash of these in an area, they can raise to a hate crime because uh, it kind of builds up after a while. And so the, so that's, we're very happy that we have the system. We just got to get people know about it more and more comfortable calling. Uh, there are some people that are a little leery about reporting that they're a victim of bias to the police. Um, and so we're trying to get past that hurdle as part of this. All right, so upcoming events. Then for coming up uh, that we know about for this next year so far, uh, we're going to do uh, eight, the Human Rights at the Market in August, and we're also uh, there helping the uh, Human right, uh, the Latah County Human Rights Task Force do their Human Rights Day at the Market in September. We're doing the Great Moscow Food Drive again in August, August 20th, I think. Is that the Saturday? I have to look on my calendar. Uh, is uh, So advertisement will be going out. We'll be set up at uh, the Farmer's Market and East City Park again. So we're going to be doing it again. Uh, we'll be participating in the Pride Festival on August 27th, Saturday, August 27th. And somehow or another, I agreed to lead the the. Pride somehow parade. or another, yes, you did. Yeah, somehow or another, I was talked into leading that and or helping organize that. But anyway, so we're going to be doing that. Um, we're also uh, working on our Inclusive Communities Month for September. And our theme this time is Healing Hate and Restorative <laughs> Justice. And so we have several activities that are lined up. So we're going to start off the month of September with our inclusive community potluck at the 1912 building. And so we just bring everybody together, uh, eat together, and hopefully everything's working well uh, COVID-wise that we can continue to do that. Um, and at that uh, dinner, we're also going to be doing the official launch of the Moscow Together project. And so we'll be announcing it and getting everybody to know about it. Then um, we are going to have a uh, Stop the Hate workshop that we're going to hold. And so Aaron Agidius and Lisa Salisbury, will, uh, the university, will be doing that for us. And so it's basically uh, a workshop for the community to understand the levels of hate and how the stages go through and how do you um, counteract this in a lot of different ways. And so they're going to be doing that. Then we're bringing in a speaker uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, growing up in a neo-Nazi family. Uh, and uh, basically, her father was a neo-Nazi, uh, part of the Aryan nations. Uh, her mother divorced her father and took the kids and got away because her kids were being brought up in hate. And then her mother wrote a book, did not quite finish the book before she passed, her, the daughter is now talking about it all, promoting the book, all of that. And so she's going to come and talk um, a little bit about what uh, was like growing up with hate uh, as part of this. And then the family, you know, the kids getting out of it because of their mother. And then the last one we're going to near the end of September, we're going to do some type of restorative justice event. Not quite sure what that is yet, but there are people working on that particular one. Uh, so, and I see Marie nodding because she's helping with that. Um, and so hopefully we'll have that uh, 
lined out here soon on that particular one. We try to do one event a week during the month of September that follows the theme. Of course, we're going to continue working on the Moscow Together project. And as I said, we're going to launch it officially in September. And we're hope to have it through the process up to the city council in August is the plan. So if everything works out right, um, as part of all of that. And then we'll do our Indigenous Peoples Day activities in October 2022. We're going to have it a live event in Friendship Square again, um, as long as everything works out well. And so I'm in the process of planning it now, working with uh, the um, universities, both universities, tribal centers, and the Nimipu. Uh, and so hopefully we'll have a, a drum group, we'll have some speakers, storytellers, and uh, the and hopefully they'll still be able to do it. But the uh, native uh, student group on campus will be selling uh, Indian tacos and other food as uh, as part of this, and they can use it as a fundraiser mm -hmm. then for them. And so, still not completely finalized, but all of it still is in the process. So we're getting close on that one. And then we'll participate, once again, as always, uh, in the MLK Human Rights Breakfast with the uh, task force coming up in January 2023, which everyone's hoping will be live, a live event. And hopefully by then, everything will be such that we're not worrying about all this as much. So hopefully that works out. Um, and so then on that. And that is it. And now, um, questions. Well, that was uh, a recounting of not just what's going on in the past year, but uh, I think you encompassed 30 months start to finish throughout <laughs> active commission. So questions? Thank you for the presentation and for your work. I'm curious if we're expecting an online component to the bias reporting system in the future, in addition to the call line. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would love to see that too. The reason we went the route we did is because the system was already set up, the phone system through the police department. So it was already there. Nobody had to create anything and the city didn't have to spend a dime. <laughs> so that's why we went that route because it was easiest. But yes, we would love to see it expanded to an online format and all that. And, and it is anonymous. Of course, we prefer people to leave their information because it's hard to follow up on things if it's anonymous, but anonymous still gives us information. And we're also... Um, linked up with the University of Idaho's bias reporting system that we share information because uh, Chief Fry uh, serves on that uh, committee over there. And so that way, both sides know what's happening. So on their in their respected areas. So, you know, and, and also takes care of any duplicates, you know, because Sometimes maybe they report to the university. It happened in town, but they report to the university. They report to us. Uh, maybe they report to one, but not the other. And so that way it coordinates our efforts because we can't join them into one because the university has a whole lot of privacy restrictions under uh, the, their rules that they can't do that. But, you know, we can at least share certain information with each other. And I have a follow up. Is it being utilized? Line? A, a tiny bit, but not a whole lot, right? True, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we've only received about three phone calls since it's put, been put in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to get it out there. They can do and it. And it's interesting because I have people, like when I was tabling at the market, people came up to me and said about things. And I said, well, you need to officially report this, not just tell me, because that's anecdotal then. Um, and so uh, report it. And a couple of them did not know it existed. And so we definitely need to get the word out more. And the third one was uncomfortable calling the police department number. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get over that hurdle too. So thank you for sharing. So it's going to take time. It's going to take time, but I'm hoping that we get more input on it as, because I know there's probably been more than three that have happened in the community, but they're just not being reported, so. Is there a way, if people are nervous to report it to the police department, that they could report it to you or something? They can, but it... It loses its emphasis, but I'm yeah. just trying to and, and they like, do. what do you and, do with the person that they don't report it because um, 
they're nervous to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people still bring it to us Mm -hmm. uh, when they're not, they don't know that they can report it there or um, they're uncomfortable doing that. Um, And we try to encourage them to do it though, just because then there's a record of it. Otherwise Mm -hmm. it's not quite the same. I mean, we get some information because that's what we had before. We would just get people coming to us and telling us, but we wanted something more official. Thank you. So can I ask, what's the idea behind having the data then? Because my understanding is part of what makes things so hard in Idaho is there's no codified definition of a hate crime in part. And so I know that's that was a topic of conversation, seeing some of what (coughs) um, had happened in Boise at the and Frank Memorial and things like that. So I'm trying to understand. I think there's an education piece as far as like telling people what bias is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's an education piece as far as getting people comfortable with the idea of calling the line. But what are we going to do with the information once... Once well, we, if we are, let's say every, every let's say every right if every does everything it. every incident of bias is being reported, what are we going to do? What's right. the hope? So ser- several things. Uh, one, um, there is a follow up that's done on each case, okay. and that and, and it's investigated, and so that lets people know they are being heard, Absolutely. and we're trying to do something. So there's part of that. If it rises to the level of a crime, then Chief Ryan, the police department, takes care of it then. Uh, but also, uh, from the Human Rights Commission's point of view, and actually Chief Fry's point of view, because we talked about this, by having that data, it tells us what's happening in the community. So is there a period of time that we're having a rash of them? And and are they a certain type? Mm-hmm. And so should we be directing more resources or education in that area? Um, and it gives the police department a heads up uh, on that, okay, look, there's a whole bunch of these kind of bias incidents happening. A lot of times that's the first step towards crimes mm-hmm. being committed. And that gives the chief and the police department you know, they can see the layout oh. of what's happening so that they can get on it beforehand. And so so it gives us advance notice. It gives us information that we can then target directing resources. And I realize um, I, I misspoke. I, it's There is a hate, ki- hate crime defined in code, but there's no reporting, required reporting mechanism, I think, for, if I remember right, for our districts and, and um, mm-hmm. police folks to capture it and report it up through the state. So that's it's hard for us to understand what that landscape looks in the state in part because there's this weird gap in, in code. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that we're doing what we can to, to fill the gap at home. I have one other question about the, the mm-hmm. food drive. Um, so I, I used, I grew up, vol- I grew up volunteering with the police cares food drive in the fall. Uh, I think they usually do it like first weekend in December. I remember being cold. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of what we can do if, um, I love that there is a great Moscow food drive. This is actually the first time I've heard of it, so I feel like a noodle head for not knowing. But I, um, I'm, I'm wondering if we're, if, if it makes. I'm sure there's a need in August when we're running it in August before all the students get into town. But I'm wondering what it looks like to also be supporting existing organizations who have a dedicated focus on those sorts of food security things, and if that, if it would also um, increase the commission's bandwidth if it meant folding in or or or. I guess piggybacking on. Well, we, we have been uh, active in um, food insecurity type of things. And then there was the uh, poverty on the Palouse group mm-hmm. that, and they were dealing with food insecurity, but COVID sort of had that go away because they never started meeting again. Um, and so we were tapped into that, but they stopped gotcha. meeting. Um, and then we do things with the food banks and the weekend for food programs. In fact, uh, Thursday, I'll be packing bags um, for that. Because we send them home at the at the Friday lunch through yeah. the federal program, so the, the yeah, separate organization right. can so provide we, the food. We, cool. So, uh, uh, and actually, that one's run by the Unitarian Universalist Church and the Episcopal Church. They pack Super. the bags and give them out on Friday for so the kids have food over the weekends, and and so we're tapped into that as well. Uh, we are looking into other food insecurity issues, and we have been, um, and talking about can there be more uh, community garden space uh, done, because as you know, mm-hmm. it's limited right. in town. And so, so yeah, we're, we're aware of these things and we're tapping into it. Uh, we are talking to a lot of these different groups and what they need and advertising it. The thing is, is there are other groups working on it and there are several food drives that happen throughout the year. And that's the sad part is that we provide all that food in August, 
by October, they're out Gone, again, right. <laughs> if not early, if not September. Um, and so periodically different groups do this and not all helps. Mm -hmm. Plus the donations to the Westside Food Pantry and the Moscow Food Bank. Um, and we're involved in it uh, as much as we can be, mm -hmm. but you okay, know, it's one, one issue among many. And hey, so we do what we can with it. I, appreciate <laughs> it. I, I, I'm not sure if this is for Mia or if it is for Chief Fry or if it's for Ken. Um, you mentioned something about the bias uh, reports being made and then we, we investigate who's we and what kind of training do they Mia have? follows up on this. So um, the, you know, hate crime code that people call it, it's malicious harassment. So we do have a state code that addresses crimes that are geared or because of a person's race, color, religion, ancestry, or national origin. And so there are sentencing enhancements and a specific code related to that. Okay. So when someone calls and believes that they've witnessed a crime that's on the basis of someone's race, color, religion, ancestry, they report it to law enforcement. We want them to report it to law enforcement so that it can be investigated. And so law enforcement can do what they do best and, and conduct their investigation. Um, at that point, if for whatever reason there's not enough evidence or they're not able to, you know, substantiate any of the claims or the person doesn't want to provide any identities, then we have this report. I do, I do review it, especially if there's no charges that have been filed, just to see if there's anything, you know, see if I agree that there was no charges filed, if there's anything more that we can do. Mm -hmm. I sometimes will reach out to the person who reported, you know, is there anything that we can do for you? Are you sure you don't want to share any information more than what you shared? Um, these are types of services that are available. So it's just one more person who's just taking a look at, um, you know, what someone's reporting as a uh, bias. So we meant the MPD. That inter that interviews yeah. and investigates. Okay, good. Because I, I I think of the tree commission loose on Moscow, and that no. scares yeah, me a little no. bit. No, no, no. <laughs> we we don't. I'd be right with them. We don't but. investigate. We have no. We awesome. Give it to the chief good. who is our good. liaison. So okay. I think okay. it's important that we do that reach out and that sort of thing. But I I want it to be somewhat controlled too. So yeah, and good. and all the human rights commission really gets is kind of data so that we can see these trends okay. and is there certain problems that we need to address and things awesome. of that nature. Okay. A point of clarification, which is it? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, while the state does not recognize LGBTQ as a protected class, I, Moscow does, correct? Wait, wait, is there some statute? Yes. That's, yes. Yeah, I believe we do have a Moscow city code that addresses that. Okay, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So in the interest of moving on, Ken, thank you for the report. And I appreciate that and the work of the commission as a whole. So thanks for reaching out, collaborating with all the other agencies, and carry on with the good work. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Next up is a proposed daycare code amendment uh, presented by Captain Anthony Dallinger and Katie Short. And by the way, uh, after the presentation, uh, don't because this is an ordinance consideration, we'll still have public testimony. Same rules as before, three minutes or less. Don't waste time. Three minutes goes by very quickly. Yes. Get to the point. Uh, and we'll do that for a little while until things perhaps become redundant. And then we'll move on to council consideration. So with that, Katie, go for Good it. Good evening, council. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. So I updated my um, PowerPoint a little bit from the admin committee to address some of the questions that you guys brought up during that meeting as well. Um, and there's time for questions at the end. So first, I kind of wanted to explain a little bit um, about what our roles are. So I process all applications, conduct all background checks, maintain current CPU and training hours for all licensed daycare providers. Um, I stay in pretty constant contact with all directors or managers of each facility as well. Currently, we have 110 daycare providers across 13 daycares in the city of Moscow. Justin Goodwin, who's in the audience, um, he conducts all facility inspections. So he's the one who 
he goes in and he makes sure that everyone's in compliance with their building codes, um, ratios, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then Corey O'Brien is the third part of our little trio. And she um, licenses the actual license for the facilities, depending on their size and how many children they're proposing on having. So if I can't answer your questions, because I'm really versed in disqualifiers and providers, Justin's in the audience and he can answer those other questions for you guys too. To give you a little bit of history, back in 2019, um, we were approached by a provider who had some major concerns oops, about, sorry. Does this, everybody, it's okay. It totally does. Um, major concerns about not being able to meet the need for um, her wait list that she had and some other concerns um, about disqualifiers and everything. So we held our first meeting here in city council chambers for parents and um, providers to come in and kind of voice their concerns about their current code. From that meeting, we formed a task force where um, one provider or manager from each facility came and sat down and we went line by line through the code about what they wanted to change, what they would like to see in it, and what we as a city could do. We had two meetings that was held on January 27th and February 3rd, and then COVID hit. So everything was kind of put on hold um, while Justin and Corey and Anthony and um, Captain Crassel at the time and Mia and all of us kind of worked with the code continuously trying to figure out how we could meet those needs that were outlined in those first two meetings. Um, in July, of we had a second or had our first public posed those um, changes to the public where we invited parents, providers, anyone who had an invest, who had a vested interest in changing the code to come and speak their concerns about what we were proposing. And in May, we had a second meeting about those proposed changes as well. So, so that brings us to where we are currently with um, our proposed changes. So the first thing that we are proposing is that we um, remove a registered daycare from the city code as a classification. Um, we, it was kind of a, re a redundant part of the code anyways. And so in order to make it more concise, we took it out and included it in the family daycare facility, which is anyone less than any per facility providing care for less than seven children. Um, under this current proposal, we are suggesting that we don't license these facilities. We give them the option if they'd like to be licensed and we would, but we're not requiring it. There was no minimum age for a provider um, to work in a facility. So the city code currently, the ratios go up to the age of 13. So age 14 was um, the logical option to start allowing people to work in the facilities. We have a couple of daycares who have children who are age 14 who live in the home. And so they wanted to be able to license them as well. So that way they could count in the ratios. However, they are not allowed to be unsupervised until they're 18. One of the biggest things that came up during those task force meetings was, um, this one is, oh, the misdemeanor drug crimes. Um, so we felt that we would remove the words admitted to from the city code when it came to misdemeanor drug crimes that's still in play for felony drug crimes, but um, we felt that if an officer um, goes to a house and contacts someone about marijuana use or a report, and that officer de deems that at the time they didn't feel like, they felt that a warning was sufficient, that admitting to having that marijuana or, and having it confiscated wasn't a reason to disqualify someone from having um, a daycare provider's license for up to five years. So um, it's just the admitted to, if they are still, if they are charged, if they plead guilty or found guilty or receive a withheld judgment, it's still a disqualifier. 
Um, the other things in the disqualifying section of the code that really brought a lot of discussion during those task force meetings were the alcohol violations. Um, we felt that if someone at 15 got in trouble for an MIP, that they shouldn't be disqualified from having a license until they're 20 as well. So um, we wanted to propose taking out persons under the age of 21, not being allowed to purchase, attempt, or purchase, or otherwise consume or possess any alcohol beverage. Um, number 27, which was persons under the age of 21, not allowed to purchase, attempt to purchase, serve, dispense, or consume beer, wine, or other alcohol liquor, or um, the violation of the city's open container law. So we would remove those from the city code. Remove from the code or remove as a disqualifier? Remove as a disqualifier from the code. Um, the next thing is that we wanted to increase the amount of training required um, in order to get your provider's license from the current four hours to 12 hours. We didn't feel that more training was a bad thing. And um, most providers have to have 12 hours of training anyways to be ICCP funded. So um, a lot of our daycares are already requiring of that of their providers. Um, one of the biggest topics in our meeting was um, changing the ratios. Um, the proposed ratio takes out the convoluted 0.83 points for 5 to 7 and 0.6 points, 66 points for 7 to 13. Um, it makes, that's on a 10 point scale and it makes when you go in and you're counting how many kids are in a room, very difficult. Um, so we're proposing a 12 point scale actually. And, um, that increases one increases the ratio to about one child in, in, in the infant stage to, um, provider. Currently it's three infants to one provider. This would increase it to four to give you guys a little bit of comparison. Um, as you can see, the current code says that um, it's one provider to three infants, basically, um, but they're between the ages of zero to two. Our proposed code would be zero to one, and so you're lessening the age. And we did that because um, during our task force meetings, a lot of the providers felt that between zero and one, there's not as much growth. Um, Whereas zero to two, there's a lot of developmental growth. And so kind of limit it, even though we're increasing the amount of kids. Um, I pulled some comparisons. So Pullman is, not, they don't regulate daycares on a city level. They allow the state to regulate theirs. Um, they are on an infant one to four ratio. Coeur d'Alene um, is 0 to 14 months rather than the 0 to 12 months that we're proposing, but they are also on a 1 to 4. The state code, which is what governs everyone in our area except for Moscow, allows for a 1 to 6 ratio, and that's up to 2 years old, 0 to 2. So to give you guys a little bit of comparison on where we fall on the scale, currently we're very restrictive. Um, we're trying to find the happy medium where we're not overextending the providers, but also allowing for some of those facilities that say we need to accept more kids. How can we do that to allow for a little bit more? Um, the second thing that we were going to completely remove from the city code was the um, temporary licensing. This is already something that we that we do, we just don't hand out a hard copy saying, here's your temporary license. Um, it was kind of just a redundant part of the code. Providers are marked as temporary in our system um, and they're not allowed to be unsupervised until they do receive their license after they've completed the background check, turned in their CPR and turned in their training hours. So this just um, is better practice for us. Can I ask for definition and clarification? Mm -hmm. So going back one. So, oh, and you're about to cover it with the provider, but I, yeah, I have a hard time 
when I first saw the number that said 110 providers, that's like the people who are working in the daycare yes. industry registered facility. And so that is the difference between me as a 17 year old wanting to go work at Moscow Day School. And I can do that while you are processing the paperwork through the employer because I can't be unsupervised anyways. And so I can start working with. Yeah. So you have to turn, if you're, if you're going to be an employee, you have to turn in your light, your application um, to us at the police department within five business days okay. of when of you hiring. start of your hiring date. And then you have 30 days to complete your training hours, your CPR and the background, the background check comes back within 30 days typically. Yeah. So why would we give a license to someone who hasn't finished the training? That's, that's what we're saying. So we don't want to, we don't want to provide a temporary license. Um, you, okay, I'm a little confused because I thought so, you said, um, unless they're supervised, but then who would supervise someone if they haven't gotten their training yet? So each facility, the director has to be licensed. Um, they, most facilities have more than one provider. So there's other supervised or other licensed providers who have completed the background check and the training and CPR requirements. So they have to be in the room with the unlicensed provider. So unsupervised means that someone has to be supervised and the person has to be in the room. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, there was no definition for a provider in our current code either. So um, we're proposing that it just be defined as a person who can provide unsupervised care to children once they have met the background CPR and training hour requirements outlined in this chapter and must renew their license every year, which is consistent with what we do now. Um, then our insurance requirements, we're just um, meeting what our insurance provider has recommended. We're moving from 300,000 per occurrence and 600,000 aggregate to um, $500,000 per occurrence and $1 million aggregate. Um, we wanted to, so we need to be as, con, as restrictive <coughs> as the state. Um, but some housekeeping things that we needed to catch up on is um, adopting a definition for school age children. That's anyone from age five to 21. Um, and under our current code, uh, you're only allowed to um, have a vaccine ex exemption if it is um, deemed by the by a provider as harmful or um, medically necessary for a child. And so we would like to adopt the state code, which would allow for religious, medical, and other exemptions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why 21? Why school age going all the way up to 21? <laughs> so that's a state thing, but I believe it's um, because at 21 you can purchase alcohol. Is that right? Or so, but isn't it also because if yeah. someone has disabilities, they can be in school that's until they're twenty-one. Was... School until twenty-one. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. I, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, another state code that we are just trying to catch up on is allowing for visitation, um, and just making sure that in our code it states that parents or legal guardians have the ability to have access to their children at any time during their daycare stay, um, unless otherwise dictated by a court. And then um, this is just defining who at what time needs a background check. So everyone under state code, anyone who's in a daycare facility on a regular basis needs to have a background check done. Um, the state doesn't define what regular basis is. So um, as a city, we decided that regular, regularly on the premises of a daycare should be defined as anyone who's there more than 12 hours in a month. Um, and that's because that's what the limit is for um, a volunteer classification in our city code. There, um why 13 and 14? And why would we test a 13-year-old that's living in the residence versus a 14-year-old employee? 
Because we earlier we said 14 years, you, you have to be at minimum 14 years. So now we're testing 13 year olds. It's a really good question. It's what's in code currently. I believe that's the requirement in state code. Is it? This confusion for me, I'll just lot. say straight up in here. Yeah. Sometimes they use the word 13 and sometimes there's 14. And it gets confusing in terms of which one that is. It's, right. it's a very confusing concept. So 13 year olds are, is, um, if mostly for children who live in an in-home facility. So um, we have a daycare. She runs it out of her home. She has a 13 or 14 year old kid and who is living in her home and she is there while she's providing care to um, other children. And so in this case, her 13 year old would need to have a background check. Um, 14 is just the minimum age that you can become an a licensed provider with the city. So this 13 year old who lives in her home will undergo a background check, but doesn't necessarily count in her ratios or um, can provide care. She's just, we're safety undergoing, issue. A, yes, the safety undergoing issue. a background check. Yeah. And it is in the IDO code where it does say um, under the health and safety. So under title 39, chapter 11, which is a basic daycare license that all owners, operators, and employees of a daycare facility who have direct contact with and all other individuals 13 years of age or older who have unsupervised direct contact with children or are regularly on the premises of a daycare facility shall complete and pass a criminal history and background check. It's just match and state. Yeah. Okay. That's mega confusing. <laughs> and we're trying to make it a little bit more clear. <laughs> it's a way of confusing in our current code, too. Yeah. And oh, wait, I have more question about yeah. background check. So the request comes to you for the background check. Um, we're maybe evaluating a facility, and the do you the employer who's usually paying the fee for this background check. I'm guessing it could um, sometimes about, be the employee, but it's about fifty fifty across okay. all of our thirteen facilities. Some require it as um, like a condition. You you pay for it, but if you continue working for us for this amount of time, we'll refund Members. you. Some the provide the facility just pays for their provider's fee. Um, it really is dependent on the facility. It's eighty dollars per. It's ninety two for every brand new provider. Okay. Um, that includes our in house background check, fingerprinting, and ISP, which is a nationwide check. Um, health and welfare, child abuse and neglect registry. Um. Yeah, the, the, those. It covers all. It covers the fee for all of those. Yeah, that was my other question. Was if you're able to, because I saw that we're removing a bunch of definitions of, um, or it's like it's out like, like the felon or like if you've if you've ever been convicted of um, child or anything like that. So we're our database. Our scope is Idaho, right? And so, or let me. That was I said that as a statement. I should have said that as a statement. <laughs> What we're searching for background checks, mm -hmm. it would pull up anything of concern from someone from, who has a record out of date. Is yep. that correct? That's correct. Yep. And okay. where we're crossing out, where it crosses it all out in the proposed code, it's just because we're going to say, Match the please state. see the state code on this. Perfect. Um, so that way, if legislation does make any changes, we're, um, we're still consistent with what cool. they are. We don't have to go through this whole process of adding or subtracting. Awesome. Would you like us to, to not hold questions or ask them now? Uh, oh, yeah. You can Sorry. ask them now. It's okay. Yeah, there's a sec there's a slide at the end, but <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> um, questions that happen during admin committee: um, How many children or how many child care facilities provide care for infants? I went through my list. I contacted just to double make sure. We have six um, out of the 13 f licensed facilities in Moscow that currently pr provide care to infants. Um, how were, how was the public notified of, um, prior meetings, those two meetings specifically that were held in July of 2021 and then May of 2022. And I reached out to each of the daycares individually. I provided them a flyer. Um, we put it out on social media on the city's Facebook page, um, and also went through the regular public meeting channels as well. And then um, I know you had some questions about AEDs. Um, I did get the answer to that, that no, um, each facility does not, um, is not required to have an AED, but they are available to infant and toddler size. 
So each facility could if they'd like. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions from the council that aren't going to delve into deliberation? Julia. Um, can a daycare, <coughs> like a private daycare, can they make more restrictive vaccine rules at their facility? Yes. So any proposed changes, if the council approves them, doesn't mean that the facility has to adopt that as long as they are more restrictive. Just like the city, we can be more restrictive than the state. The facility can be more restrictive than the city as well. Okay. And that's not discrimination? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody says, I don't want to vaccinate my child because of a religious reason. And I'll just pick on Moscow Day School because my kids aren't there. Moscow Day School says, um, sorry, we don't allow unvaccinated children. So, again, I think I think um, the way Katie answers, it's accurate. Um, any daycare provider can have more restrictive requirements than what the city code allows. We're providing a minimum um regulations, just like the state code provides minimum. If a facility wanted to have something more restrictive and they chose not to allow certain children because they didn't meet whatever their restrictions were, and someone lodged a complaint saying that they believe, you know, they're exercising discriminatory practices, there's nothing we would do from an enforcement perspective as it relates to their daycare provider license as to whether there would be any civil cause of action. I'm not going to give any legal advice related to that. <laughs> I have one more question. Sure. Um, so I went to the daycare meeting at uh, Association of Idaho Cities and it's very interesting. And not very many cities have these uh, um, restrictions. So no. why does Moscow have a daycare licensing process when the state could also provide that? That's a really good question. So it was explained to me that well before my time and well before my pre predecessor's time, um, a similar meeting like the first one that we had in December of 2020 or 2019 occurred where People in the community came to um, city council and came to our city's administration and said, we're not happy with how the state is um, enfor in enforcing their daycare code, and we'd like to be more restrictive. So that's when they came up with the 0.83 and 0.66 <laughs> ratios. Um, but... That was, and that's where we've been ever since. And so now we are coming back again. And okay. it's always an option, but it seemed like to go to the state and allow the state to regulate our daycares. Um, but there was a general consensus that our providers did not want that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a series of questions. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'm thrilled that uh, Moscow has a more restrictive approach to this than the state does. I will also say that I approach this issue um, from the position of safety. And um, so I have a couple of questions based on that, looking down the code. Okay. I'll try to answer them as best <laughs> as I can. And if not, Justin is in the audience. <laughs> okay, so what the one... I have a series. One is, is that I'm not sure why we don't require home daycare centers to be regulated if they have um, seven or more children. So currently we do. Right. Um, yeah, but and one of the hard things about enforcing that is we have daycares that pop up randomly and um, they might only provide care for five or six kids and they're just doing it as a side favor for a friend and they're trying to become more established, but they don't know that the city requires um, them to be licensed or to go through inspections and stuff like that. So it's already a very hard thing to regulate. Um, and the state, it was part of going to a little bit more of the state standard, but not quite all the way. Um, so I, I find that troubling, just to tell you straight up here. And if you look at um, the proposal that we got that talked about C, it actually said 
can't succeed five children, and we got rid of that, and we went up to seven. Um, that's the first question that I, that I mean, you answered. That I'm just saying that's a hard one for me. Mm-hmm. And then, especially if you can, you don't count the unrelated, um, the the kids who are already in the home. Mm-hmm. So that if somebody has their own set of twins, and you suddenly get, you know, four more kids, I mean, how in the little, how do you get them all out when there's a fire? I mean, mm-hmm. what is the safety issue on that? And so that's partially some of those questions that come up, especially if you start looking at unregulated that you don't even know they exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I struggle with that decision to not regulate home ones. Mm-hmm. And I, okay, so that's the first I just want okay, to. <laughs> okay, that's a deliberation. The next one is um, so that if you are home, this is a question, if you are a home daycare provider and you did not have seven kids that weren't partially your own, mm-hmm. um, that that 13-year-old would not be have a background check. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so how would Unless you-, you chose to become a registered daycare with okay. the city of Moscow, and at which point they would be. Okay. Um, okay, so then we, I get I also get caught on getting rid of the definition that said um, a family daycare center, but then we go on and we relate to that specifically and use that term again, um, specifically a family daycare center, a home place or facility providing the care for six or fewer children. So we really do have another category. We just don't, we have, you said in the beginning, there was like three categories and now we have four categories. I'm just a little lost on that in terms of there's a consistency with these things. I, maybe I should just sit down and talk to my own on this, but I don't want to spend the whole meeting on it. But I've got lots of questions overall with respect to this and how it's done. Yeah. Um, and maybe I should have attended the administrative meeting, but I, um, I didn't. Um, So that's hard. Okay, I also have this question about unsu. Yeah. If you want, yeah, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. So, to- <laughs> so mayor, mayor council, to answer your question on the family, the the six or less. So, the definition is is it still can call itself a daycare. It's just not registered through the city of Moscow if they are six or fewer. So I, I believe that's why we left that that definition in there, if that makes sense. It, it, it totally makes sense. It's whether I agree with it is the question. Okay. Um, and so that's a different thing. And part of it becomes yeah. down to a question that really talks about safety. And if they have additional kids, they have six kids in the house. And maybe this is deliberation that I'm not supposed to talk to about it. But the only question just I could have questions, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, so, so just say it. So how do you get all the kids out of the house if there's a fire? Yeah. I that's that question, right? that's well. That's why on registered daycares we require fire drills, and we we make them practice the fire drills. So and how do you know they exist? They don't have to exactly. register with you. How would you if, know? They and exist? you know, it, you know, we can go back to what if they only had three children and were unregistered. You know, uh, I really can't answer that okay, question. I'm so sorry. I should just tell you straight up that I come from the perspective of one. Um, having a student of mine whose child got beaten in a home setting and got called up for an 18-year-old baby that had been beaten with bruises, and um, they were not registered. Um, and they, so I think I come from that safety perspective of how do we make sure that these things don't well, happen. And, and I and I was, and you as the council, because remember, this is this is the council's code. If, if council chooses to keep us still as is right now, uh, we, we definitely can. This is just, you know, some proposals that, we thought to clean up the code would help out. Um, mm-hmm. If we go to family daycare, like you're talking about, and keep it the way it is, we are more stricter than what the state is, and we would be still within our legal rights to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can, can I tell you, ask another question sure. on this unsupervised? And the question there is, the definition is the person must be in the room. So if you're running a home daycare center and someone's upstairs with a baby in a crib and somebody, what does that really mean when someone can be unsupervised? So when we, when I say we, when Katie and I go out and do our inspections, um, <clears throat> unsupervised is, or supervised, excuse me, is you are in that room. Um, if that person goes upstairs, you have to go with them. 
you know, or that person does not go upstairs. Um, yeah, everything. Right the, you got to the podium. We got to get you on the yeah. record. Yeah, that is that, that includes everything. Yeah. So includes like we go taking a toddler to the ba bathroom or anything like that. If if the provider, the they can't be left alone. No. They have to be always constantly with another person who is a licensed provider until they are licensed or until they're eighteen. Okay. I have one final question. Just a question. It is just a question. Do we know why, um, for the audience's context, section 10-17 health requirements, section C requires every dog, cat, and ferret over four months to be um, <laughs> vaccinated against rabies? Is it because ferrets are more, why, why the call out about ferrets? Do we I know? Does anyone, that, someone else asked me that I and I don't have the answer. I have that exact same question and pointed it out as well. If I, anyone has vet background, I'm wondering if they're just more prone to rabies, but that was, okay. Or they're just nasty and they'll bite you sooner than the rest of the animals on this planet. Kind of stinky. <laughs> Who knows? Just think. Fair, not deliberation. Go. That's a good well, question. I'm going to take out. For, I'm kidding. It's great. All right. That's what I got. Okay. At this point, um, I'd like to hear from the public. Uh, come up to the microphone. Three minutes. Name, address, and say your piece, and we'll move on to the next. So, please. Hi, my name is Marissa Marr. I moved here to Moscow in 2018 and actually opened an unlicensed daycare <laughs> in my home. And I met many of you when I called, I called you on the phone and said, I want to grow. Um, can you come look at my house and see if this is appropriate? So before the kids even came in, I had, I think within a, an hour, about 10 people with measuring tapes and opening and closing doors. And I thought, small towns are so different than the city. <laughs> and it, it was a very welcoming place for a small business and for a small income home daycare. And in terms of safety, it is optimal for daycare centers to be registered. And so much of this discussion is how do you alleviate those obstacles? And for our family, the obstacle was ultimately needing to be fully vaccinated and our family were religious and philosophical objectors to that. And so we just had to leave our numbers low to stay within the legal limit of the number of children I cared for. So after two years, we ended and, and moved on to something else because it was unsustainable. And my vision was to grow it, but it was unsustainable with the numbers being as low as they were. But I enjoyed it and it was a wonderful experience. Another story along with that is a friend who's actually moved out of the area. Her son was in my school and she said, you know, I had to drive to Pullman because my child is not vaccinated and he was refused admittance from all licensed daycares in the city of Moscow. And this was the only way I could get him in a preschool. And she also was a single mom as well. So it wasn't an option to just keep him home till he was five and send him with the religious objectors to the public school. So um, there are members of the community who are put on the sidelines and who um, miss out because of the way this, the city code is now not being consistent with state code. I talked to my, um, I'm looking at feeling out different options to re-enter the workforce. I've been a stay-at-home mom for several years. And now that my two-year-old is, is getting older, I'm thinking, okay, daycares and preschool. And of course, I'm confronted again with this dilemma. And so I talked to my um, physician and asked about my daughter getting potentially a medical exemption because of concerns I had. And she said, no, she said she's had to deny every single that this has come up to her before. She's had to deny medical exemptions to children going to daycare in town. And she's only been able to, to write off one because of a, a particular medical situation with seizures. And I could tell on her face that this was weighty. And she mentioned to me that she wished that the city would leave it up to the parents to decide and not, you know, it, it turns her into the bad guy. And I felt for her because I've worked in public schools for over 10 years. That relationship is so important. And when you have to be the bad guy and tell your parents no when when you may or may not agree with with what's being imposed 
it fractures that relationship and that that physician parent child relationship is really important. So I just wanted to highlight some other aspects. I know that there are multiple issues on the docket with um, making daycare more accessible, but I love Moscow and how it's how it's very friendly towards business. So thank you for this forum and this opportunity to speak. Can I, can I make one comment too? Because actually under the new code, it does say that basically it's, you know, physician as well as um, a philosophical exemption. So that would allow you to do that. That doesn't mean the daycare center has to let you do it. But if you ran a daycare center under this, mm. there's nothing in there that requires that you have to have your kids vaccinated. It, it would increase the opportunity for parents who are religious and philosophical mm -hmm. objectors. It would increase their opportunity to be Within a licensed daycare, now they're completely blocked right. from from do, from participating. Right. I mean, Idaho is one of fifteen states that we that has that exemption, sure. and so um, this provision actually allows that that you could run your daycare center without that requirement. Right. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Who's next? Uh, good evening, Mayor Becky, Council Members, uh, Dulcie Kirsting Lark, uh, 803 East 8th Street here in Moscow. Um, I attended the July 2021 meeting as well as the May 2022 meeting um, that um, these fine folks put on. Uh, and I was really grateful for those opportunities. I will say, I think I was the only parent in attendance at the July 2021 meeting um, that wasn't part of a facility. Um, and uh, I there at the May 2022 meeting, there was quite a bit of concern expressed over changing of ratios. And I think that's pretty um, clear that people have some concerns about the safety of that. I have some concerns about changing our age brackets. Um, I think a 12 month old is much different than a 24 month old in terms of mobility, especially for children who are walking a little bit later. So um, I would like to see maybe at least the difference split on that to like zero to 18 months and then an 18 to 24 month category or an 18 to 36 month. Um, I, I would feel safer about that, but um, really I would just like to express my feeling that changing these ratios is not going to fix the childcare dilemma in this town or in Idaho or in the country. And adding potentially six or 10 more infant spots is not going to actually provide enough care for all the infants that need care in this town for families that want to be working. Um, the Idaho Workforce Development Council just put out a, a white paper last month, I think, that said Laytock County has a deficiency of 290 seats for children um, under five that need childcare. A lot of those are infants. Infant care is very expensive. Infant care does not actually make a lot of financial sense for most providers. So um, I, I respect that this is a way the city's trying to make something easier for working parents, but I, I see that there is a potential for more harm than good to come from this. This is not going to meaningfully add a lot of seats to the brackets of childcare that we need it the most in, and that's like the under three-year-old brackets. So um, I just, I have some pretty strong concerns about changing the ratios. I think it's wonderful that we have a more restrictive code. Um, because setting it at the bar with the state of Idaho, I love living in Idaho, but I I think Idaho is pretty lenient when it comes to the uh, the way we oversee the care of our children um, in a lot of ways. And that's just my personal opinion, but I don't think I'm the only one. And I would rather um, we in the city of Moscow take extra, extra care of um, the next generation of folks who are going to be um, you know, our neighbors, our friends, the folks who are working and driving the economy. Um, and I really feel for the working parents in our town. I'm one of them. Um, we are a two income household. We have to be because housing is really expensive in this town too. And you can't really get by on one parent working. So, pardon me. So childcare is really, really important um, for a lot of folks. And I wish that there was more that could be done. Um, and I don't think that this is the only creative thing the city could do to make childcare a little more accessible. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. sure. Okay, so the question I have is, other than changing the ratio, do you have any other concerns with respect to um, the 
proposed language or changes? Uh, I have concerns with the change in the age brackets. I think right now an infant zero to two, I understand a two-year-old is much different than um, a two-month-old, but um, I I don't, um, yeah, I, I have, con I, I would prefer to see it a little bit broader because there is a pretty big difference in my mind between a 12 month old and a 24 month old. And I say that as somebody who has a 23 and a half month old um, and the way that he acts now versus a year ago, I would feel a lot more comfortable with him being in a slightly larger class now than I would have a year ago. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Stevie Steely Johnson, 1450 Mill Road, and I'm not here to talk about garbage or recycling. <laughs> um, I actually didn't plan on getting up to talk tonight, and I'm so glad that I was able to come and hear your guys' presentation. Uh, some concerns and some good things from this. The family or in-home care, that's really concerning to me. I think that we need to dig into that. I don't think that we should um, just take homes with I forget, it's like five to seven kids or less. They don't have to be registered. I think that's a mistake. I was also wondering why we chose at age 14, you can become a provider. That's a big red flag for me. I don't want any 14-year-old looking after my 17-month-old daughter or my five-year-old for that matter. My kid also, we have a five-year-old who goes to Moscow Day School, and I know many of you have kids who go there. As you know, they close at four o'clock right now because they're having a hard time finding people to hire and get through the training process. I know in our board meetings, we've talked about how do we address the training process because once they get someone hired on, um, they have to close early for a whole month because that person can't be alone for a certain period of time. So I'm no expert in this field, but maybe that's another creative solution is how much training do they have to go through? Can we budge there more than um, the ratios that we're looking at? I'm glad to see the vaccinated thing of, um, to your point, people can fill out a religious form, and I don't think that people should be going to their medical provider seeking an ex a medical exemption when they're really looking for something that's religious. So I'm glad that that's addressed. Um, my urge is that I think we need to look into this more, and I don't think that we need to pressure to make a call tonight. So I encourage that. Thank you. Thanks, Stevie. Um, Sean Quallen, 635 North Garfield. Um, I have a question, a quick question about the proposed language. Um, is there a possibility we could pull the PDF back up that's still open or? Oh, okay, okay. Um, in the code, and, and I mean, you even read this. Um, well, uh, regarding the background checks um, at 13, it's right here. Uh, in the code, in the in state code, it is all other 13 year old, uh, 13, all other individuals 13 years of age or older who are regularly on the premises, we have added in the word residing. And I, I want to have a, I'm, I'm just questioning why that was added in there. Huh? Uh, just, I guess it was yeah. more along the idea of why why the regularly residing was in there rather than just regularly upon the premises. Because I My, think you have to do a, a background check if they're volunteering anyway, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're we're not addressing Same. other thirteen year olds that are just potentially on the premises. As long as they're there, twelve hours. Up, 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 up. <laughs> Stop it, Katie! Get up. <laughs> um, as long as they're there for twelve hours. Um, or more within a one month period. Okay. So the residing doesn't mean living on the premise. Mm -hmm. So the definition and the, pro the proposed language uh, definition for regularly on the premises does say individuals 13 years of age or older who are on the premise of a daycare facility and have access to the children for 12 hours or more in any one month period. Okay. So then that residing would be incorrect that's not in the definition that we have proposed i'm looking to see it's up it's up okay it's on the screen i see just to, to just to, yeah, but the proposed language to make with all of this. does not say preside for the definition of regularly on the premise good good catch 
Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Stacy Stukes, 1882 White Avenue. Um, I wanted to know what uh, child development experts you had creating this. Um, I work for Idaho Stars. Uh, we do our statewide training. So those 12 hours that you're talking about, they would take that training free through I Idaho Stars. And um, it, I think a decision doesn't need to be made tonight because I feel that the expert piece of asking people within the education of early childhood was not included in any of this. Um, so um, uh, I appreciate the infant data and using the infants um, for this. Um, but if you look at the point system, uh, 36 months to one year is one point. So if you think about 10 three-year-olds in a room, that would be now 10 points. Now you have 12 three-year-olds in a room. I don't know if you've ever taken care of a three-year-old before, uh, but that is not quality. Um, uh, best practice is that one to 10. Um, so I, I think uh, we shouldn't rush to any decisions. <laughs> Katie. So what we're proposing is one to six for one to three, three to five, three. one to 12. Yeah. So three, three, I'm talking 36 months to five. Uh, that's one to 10, I believe. Uh, that's best practice through the NAEYC. That's the National Association for Early Young Children. Uh, and that's best practice. So um, I think more discussions need to happen with um, experts in the field. Thank you. Mr. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, Council, can um, I just want to uh, let you know when we did do all the meetings and stuff, Idaho Stars was involved. Um, the University of Idaho early, 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 early can speak i promise <laughs> childhood development was also involved and we had uh and, and state money was also involved and we did have some providers that that do have the early uh, childhood education degree who were also involved in when we were in all these meetings so um i, I believe the experts have been involved in this process for this writ, this writ of the code Okay, anyone else? Uh, my name is Kendra Rathbone and I'm actually currently living in Pullman at the moment, but um, I love Moscow, I plan to return as soon as possible. Um, I did not plan to get up and speak tonight, but there's been a, a couple of people who have spoken and kind of the idea I'm getting or the feeling that I'm getting is that there is a general want to make the situation better. Um, but the frustration is that this may not be the exact night and forum to do it. Um, there are a lot of avenues that I just really, really want to encourage people to look into research, get involved any spare minutes that you have throughout the week. It seems like it does nothing, but it actually does it. It adds up if enough people do it. Um, I wanted to share something. It's it's a fact that sadly hasn't changed, um, but I hold it with me as motivation to keep looking into ways to help. Uh, it gets bleak, but I keep going. Um, Idaho, I think, is one of four states out of all 50 that provides no state funding to preschool. The other states, if my math is correct, 56, no, 46, 46. <laughs> nerves. Um, yeah, they provide some form or in some cases um, completely provided free uh, preschool and pre-K. They figure it out. They, they make it work. 
Um, I am in no way bashing the council or Moscow. I'm just saying there's an answer out there. And um, whether it's a commission or bringing someone here to invest in more centers, um, because I don't think a state code is going to fix the problem, which someone alluded to earlier. But um, yeah, one in four states. We are one of four states that does not give any state money to children under five in their education. I'm going to end on that because I don't know how else to end. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. Anyone else? I think we've run through pretty much everybody out there. So, okay, at this point, I'll turn it over to council for their deliberations. Um, Mr. Mayor, I would like to see this maybe go back to, um, not the drawing board, but uh, just have um, staff look at two things. One is the age brackets in the point system, and the other is um, reconsidering uh, requiring licenses for in-home daycares that have three to seven children or a number that you know, we can think about, but I, I'd like to see those um, areas readdressed. Your Honor, I think, um, I think I agree with uh, Ms. Parker down there. I, I think that um, it is not a bad thing to be more restrictive than the state in this, these instances. I think that what we've seen tonight is a need to, I agree with Kendra, Ms. Rathbone, that she said, you know, it is that moment everybody realizes we'd like to make it better. And, and I think that's, that's common amongst us on the bench too. I don't think they're, um, I don't think we're all the way there with the solutions being all the way baked. I think we need to, we need to continue to kind of work through this. I, I, um, that's alarming to me, the, the ratios that you would add one more infant into some of those situations just makes me crazy. That just scares me. There, there's too much opportunity for badness to happen there, in my opinion. Um, so I, I'm in complete agreement, and I wouldn't say just look at those two things. I would look at look at the pile that we have suggested um, and, and, and go back through and make sure they're the right decisions for our community. Sandra. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that also. And I, I just wanted to share my reasoning um, because I think it's important. And this is, I'm not even a mom and this really, really scares me. I'm not going to lie. When when daycare folks come in and say, we're really concerned about how many kids we have and what the ratio is. And and despite all the great work, and I, it is good work. And I don't want you to leave here thinking it wasn't good work, exactly. right? That's not it. But I, I think we need to do a little more. Because to say when they say we're worried about the ratios and then our point since adds one more, that just is a drop in the gut to me. And again, I don't even have kids, right? And I look at my friends that are moms out there or grandmas, and they're just like, holy cow, we don't know how to do this. We need more help. We don't need to add more children in, even if it's just one or two. That's a lot. So that really concerns me. And that's why when we had it at our administrative meeting, I was like, oh, I can't recommend it, but I want to talk more about it so we could all talk about it as a council. And I'm also really concerned about that age bracket. And again, I feel a little re a little ridiculous saying that because I just am an auntie to kids, right? I'm the first to admit that I'm not around little toddlers or infants all day, but I'm around them enough to know that there is a huge difference um, in ages. And two, I would really like to tighten that up a little bit and, or change it. Infants, two-year-olds, that's such a tremendous difference. And so... I love the effort put into this, and I know we're making it harder for staff and workers, but at this point, I'd rather make it harder for staff and workers than make it harder for our daycare providers that struggle every day to find staff and to find time and to find buildings, and they want to help these kids that are Moscow's, some of our finest and our best that need our help because they can't do it on their own, and it's I just, it's up to us to do just a little bit more. And I feel that that's where we're at. So I appreciate the effort. I don't want to continue this tonight because I think we need to look at these things and do just a little better. Haley. Yeah. I, um, my last one, I, I've got some, uh, you guys are really selling me on the idea of parenthood right now. Um, and I, yeah, it's, 
mostly a joke. Don't tell my mom. Um, so <laughs> I've got some concerns. The one that I haven't heard addressed yet. I, I know the state had passed the bill that would enable um, the visitation and under any circumstances. Um, I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. There it is. Any parent or guardian shall have the absolute right to enter the premises of any facility during the period of care for the parent or guardian's child or children. This is what makes me a little nervous. Any failure or refusal to allow entry to a parent or guardian may be grounds for suspension or revocation of the license. It does have the caveat, like if you've been denied um, this is visitation rights for, by a court order or something, it doesn't that doesn't apply. But I, in my mind, the way it's all laid out and the way it's laid out in the state code, that burden then falls to the child care provider to know. Um, and I just, I don't know quite what that looks like. I don't want... Um, someone who understands the code, a provider who understands the code to feel like they have to say yes at risk of um, getting their license pulled and then have have someone there who's not supposed to be there because they they just didn't know that, you know, someone shows up before the, as the papers are getting served or something like that. So I just, um, the visitation piece makes me nervous. There's enough, it sounds like there's enough other things that we're kind of looking at. Um, and again, I, I'm pretty sure the visitation clause was to match state code in that case. And, in, and that is another piece of state code that I'm not super excited about um, because I already think these daycare providers are doing a lot with little resource and, um, and that one makes me nervous. Ring. Okay. I was pretty clear in the beginning, I have questions. And so I'm not really interested in voting today, but I also do hear that there are some good things in here. And I want to say thank you for everybody who's done that. Um, but I, I, and I also think that there's this huge question about how do we solve this problem? And I think the statement that we don't provide any serve, we don't provide any resources to help people with daycare in the state of Idaho is kind of a reality that we're stuck with. And I feel terrible for parents um, who are trying to figure out where to put their children. And I also feel, um, really badly for people who are running centers that need to make a living. And the answer is it costs a lot of money to put your baby in um, daycare. And that's really hard. And I don't know how, you know, so we're trying to balance something and put a, um, a solution on in many ways, something that's not solvable because it's hard to find enough money to run that and find enough homes that will take infants in particular. So I think um, I, I personally have to struggle with this a little more and I'd be happy to attend every one of your meetings from now on. Um, but I think that those, and I'm really concerned about age issues. I, I've run conferences for child development things and the numbers shocked me um, when I saw these and maybe my numbers were more skewed towards people who maybe Anyways, but anyways, bottom line is I had professionals at that who were home care, um, who were professionals, and they were saying the numbers were much lower than that, and then we're increasing our numbers. I also think that um, what, just want to say I have no qualms if you just if we pass the uh, resolution at some point that says we're consistent with the state with respect to vaccines. I mean, the daycare center can say yes or they can say no, and if you want to provide it, and then I don't have a problem with that at all. So I just wanted to say something I didn't. Um, in terms of restrictive um, clauses in there, I want to say I agree with Haley. And for someone who's done a lot of work in her life on family divorce issues, they can make schools and daycares just disastrous places. And the fights get carried out there. And so I think, how do we do that in a way that allows to protect the children and protect the parents, and particularly the person who's providing those. So having said those, those are some of my thoughts. Um, I would really like to look at this a little longer. Um, and, and if we kind of, and I, but I wish that we could have solutions in a place that gave us more money to make these solutions. Yep. Yeah. And your turn. That's my comment too. It was mentioned explicitly in reference that this is a the underlying problem is this is a public good that's not publicly funded and there's only so much we can do to maneuver around that. And so I would say one thing sitting up here that is always a challenge to me is that people come up and they talk about some really good ideas or mention some things that we could be doing. So it's not really a conversation in this format, but if you have ideas, please feel free to share them. I can't speak for everyone, but I know I would be interested in knowing what else from a municipal standpoint we could do with the limitations working within the state of Idaho. 
And then I think since I'm the last one to go, I would support workshopping the two aspects mentioned, the age bracket and point system and requiring licenses for in-home daycares and looking at the age bracket. And I would move that we send this back to staff to consider those two aspects of the code. Um, one of the options here is to consider the ordinance on the first reading and it'd be read by title and then remand it to staff for further uh, study and rewording and bring back later as a second reading. Great. Then I move. Uh, can I ask a question? Can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> I am okay, <laughs> no, no, I, I want to ask a question about that in terms of, and what that means is actually a lot of the people who are here that worked on this are not per se staff. And so I'm just curious on who it is that's going to work on this. Um, right. And are we asking you to go back and then Put well, your we'd group be together. remanding sure. the staff to work on it, and they can assemble whichever resources they feel most appropriate to assist in some of the considerations of the age and the number, the ratio, and all the things that we've discussed up here. And, and Your Honor, if I, if I might ask a point of clarification, just for for clarity, with from, from what I've heard thus far, um, the council's consensus seems to be. They would like us to look at potentially more restrictive measures than what we're currently in in this proposal for home daycare and what was categorized as home daycare, um, a reanalysis of age brackets and looking at different options as to what might be possible and um, desirable there, and then also maintaining something more restrictive as far as the ratios than what was presented here tonight. Was that accurate as what to what we're hearing that there, you would like us to look at? There was also the clarification brought, brought by that one gentleman about the background checking the 13-year-olds that are on the premises. Yeah. That's not supposed to be, that's not, it's not in the one that we all got. So it, yeah. somehow it got right, we just need. Yeah. Make sure it's clarified. Yep. And I would be interested, so I understand the rationale for wanting to fix the brackets, because when you look at it as a layperson or as I'm sure as a new provider, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense, the math. And so something that's more simplified, but still in line with what those yeah. recommended ratios are is something I would like to see. And so actually, I would also think that it may be helpful to some of those, like, the uh, early childhood development stuff from the university and some of those people, it may be helpful to educate us as well as the public on some of those topics so that it doesn't come back just as a number without having them say, here's the studies, here it goes. Context, it yeah. is more persuasive to me um, that you have to deliver something that someone else gave you the data on. And so if you, they said, if you put the expert or the person with expertise up there, that would probably be helpful to, to me. Your Honor, what, one more point of clarification. So the our, our current code is is a more restrictive code than what has been presented here tonight. Is it the desire of the council to see us pursue this up to and beyond where current code sets the regulation? I think it's just open. I, think that well, I don't know that we can leave it that open. I think uh -huh. we need to give a direction. Otherwise, staff doesn't know where to go. Um, I, I'm just not convinced that what we're doing by 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 becoming more in line with some of the state things is actually safer and better and Moscow. So I don't know. I don't know. It's almost maybe do we need to leave Moscow's code and become more in line? So maybe we look at like the state version. I, I don't. That becomes looser than we. Be then we lose. What they're doing is actually tightening things up. In we just some spots. Some so, different in some spots, they're, we're not requiring licenses and others. But so I, it, I, it's just kind of... I think one of the fundamental questions that I think the biggest problem is that issue of money. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the number, that becomes really hard that you're balancing what I perceive to be a safety issue with the, the issue of money and how much it costs to put a child in early childhood you know, into care. Yeah. And I'm not sure how we can save, how we can do that in a way that can help people. And, and that's what I'm struggling with, to tell you the truth. I don't Mr. know how Mr. you Mr. Mayor, we do have an open motion on the floor. It wasn't seconded, was that's it? That's right. Yeah, it was not. So there is an open motion on the floor to consider the ordinance on first reading. It would be read by title and then it goes out as rework comes back for second reading. And that's the motion, but it hasn't been seconded. Can I, a point of clarification on that? And you made the motion. Is that good with what you want to move on? You yeah, kind of jumped and on I, that. I would love 
to vote on the specifics of what it is that we're providing direction on the two things that I mentioned. So yes, amending to move that we consider the ordinance on first reading and that it be read by title, providing staff with further direction to consider new options for the age bracket and point system that has been uh, recommended and the option for requiring licenses for in-home daycares and considering the age bracket or I'm sorry, not age bracket, but number at which we might want to change that. Does that make sense, Lori? Does that make sense? That makes sense to me, okay. but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, <laughs> it means some. It doesn't really make sense to the me. The last part is the ratio part. Uh, no, at what point, point you have to, at how many kids you have to have to yeah. be licensed. Oh, okay. Yeah, those are the two considerations. Can, can I give a friendly amendment to Please. that? Please. Um, and whether or not children of particular ages who are already in the home should be counted mm. because that increases the numbers significantly. I'll second that. Ah. You got Did you accept it? Yes, I accept the friendly amendment. Okay, okay so the motion as amended has a second. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Point of clarification. <laughs> Is that enough direction for these guys to do what they need to do. I believe that gives us enough okay. to go back and bring something back. And give some menu options. Happy meal, burger and fries. Got it. Okay. Can I just say thank you for your work on this, especially yeah. knowing the prolonged timeline. I'm sure yeah. for everyone giving input or working on that, that that was challenging with the pandemic. Okay. So motion seconded as amended. Voting. Anne. Aye. Sandra. Aye. Gina. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Julia. Aye. And Haley. Aye. Okay. Uh, I don't reading know by title, do I need number eight? Yeah, that's the only saving grace. Ordinance 2022 08. An ordinance of the city of Moscow, Idaho, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, providing for the amendment of Moscow City Code Title IX, Chapter 10, relating to daycare, providing that the provisions of this ordinance be deemed severable, and providing for this ordinance to be full force and effect from the date of its passage, approval, and publication according to law. And there you have it. Okay. One more item on the agenda, which is proposed amendments to taxi cab licensing requirements. Captain Dallinger. Council, Mayor. Sir. Mine's pretty straightforward, I think. So I'll just preface it with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, knock on wood. Crying out loud. Said that. Just That's trying right. to. <laughs> anyway. Um, so before you, I don't have a fancy slideshow because I think, like I said, I believe it is pretty straightforward. Uh, at the same time, when we were starting to look at some of the daycare things, we looked at the tax cab code and decided we needed to make some changes. Um, first and foremost, we're just changing the language from the city clerk being responsible for the licensure mm -hmm. of taxi cabs to Moscow PD. We've been doing it anyway, so we're just kind of clearing that up. Secondly, you'll see a lot of red lines through, through this one. Um, but moving on to the insurance requirement, that's just coming up with the times. We, we wanted to raise the, the rates, and I believe we looked at Pullman to make sure that we're on the same par uh, or same level, rather, as, as they are. So that's that change. The rest of these are more or less cleaning up the legal jargon, as we did in the daycare, where if state legislature changes the laws down the road, we don't have to make an amendment every time. They're just all of the legal codes that are depicted in the the uh, code as it is, with the exception of one that we added because we felt it was necessary and that was indecent exposure. And this is, um, of course, we're talking about denials for licenses here. Mm -hmm. The other change in the uh, code section was, again, same as the daycare, where when we're talking about a misdemeanor in level of it, uh, controlled substance, they have to plead guilty or be found guilty in a court of law in order to be that denial, not taking out that language of just saying that they were a part of something and they're not getting charged as a denial. Mm -hmm. And with that, I believe those are all the changes we we're, we we're looking at. I just have one question and it may be a, a Scrivener's thing. Um, 
it's helpful context to understand what we're seeing in terms of Pullman and uh, for the uh, automobile liability limits. Do do we need to have it listed in as presented on page two of the proposed ordinance? It lists like comparable with Pullman and prior to Moscow code limits in parentheses. I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't really mind if it's in the code. I don't know if I'm in the weeds on this one, but do you want to have it in there? Is that more, that was, that was helpful context for us, but does it need to be there in code? Okay. Okay. Scribner's thing. So, I also did Scribner's for so long. So I learned something new on that one. That's what I got. Out. Thank you for taking a look at this. Sure. I think I have a Mia question. The, I did, I, this occurred to me after the admin committee meeting. So I know that the state has prevented us from doing anything with Uber, Lyft, that kind of a thing. But my understanding of that law was not that we couldn't ask for them to meet certain requirements, drivers, right, safety requirements, but that we couldn't say that Lyft or Uber couldn't operate within the city limits. Is it both that we can't regulate their operation here or their hmm. safety of the people who are doing it? I'd have to look into that. Okay. I could have given you more notice of that yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> that question <laughs> been this nice. like, mm. <laughs> yeah, either way, I mean, I, I support the changes, but I was curious about that. I will get back to you on that. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm. This one was easier to read than the last one. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the ordinance under suspension of the rules requiring three separate complete readings and that it be read by title and published by Summary. Second. Okay, a motion second. Any other comments, questions, deliberations? Okay, Gina. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Anne. Aye. Haley. Did I goof that one? Aye. Sandra. Aye. And Julia. Aye. Well, yeah, I, okay. I've never done a, a Scrivener's Gina, correction before, so. Could you shoot me the copy of the ordinance so I can read it by title? I don't know if I can shoot you a copy you of the know, ordinance or not. I take you. my computer. All right, let's scroll on down on this sucker. Yeah, I goofed it. That's all right. Do we need to amend it? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I think Mia will tell us. It's a I think Mia will tell us if we it? need to amend it. All right. My Scrivener's thing, again, it's... We'll, we'll, re we'll remove the Pullman and the Moscow reference. Cool. That's in cool. parentheses. Right on. Yeah, those are in parentheses. So we that can... was <laughs> okay. in, oh. intended so, in my motion. 09, I take it. Okay. Ordinance number 2022-09, in ordinance of the City of Moscow, Idaho, a municipal corporation of the State of Idaho, providing for the amendment of Moscow City Code, Title IX, Chapter 5, providing that the provisions of this ordinance be deemed severable, and providing that this ordinance to be in full force and effect from the date of its passage, approval, and publication according to law. Amen. Voila. Okay, that takes us to the end of the agenda. Um, on to reports. Sandra. Uh, my most recent meeting was at the 1912 Center. We had our development meeting where um, I think the, the – Biggest change I think people will be interested in is um, to A, the historical classroom is nearly completed and that they are setting up, uh, I think curriculum is, all, is done for that. Everything is set. They just need to get the desks put back in and they're being worked on right now. And then across in the uh, another room where they have their library that will actually be um, much more organized than it was before um, the Christmas get together where it was just sort of a but I loved it. It was sort of a free for all with books all over, and you just got to look wherever. I like that, but um, most people are a little more organized than that. And oh, so wow. now they actually they're getting carts and systems, and it'll be a lot more organized. And people other than me will be able to find things much better. And uh, it, it's it's looking great. So um, second floor looks remarkable, and it's it's uh, in pretty good shape. So there was that. Um, we attended. <laughs> The budget workshop today, it doesn't seem like about a week and a half ago. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <so true. laughs> um, and so I thought, I, I want to just say, I mean, all joking aside, I thought it went really well. I was, um, staff is super impressed with how how well things were put together, how well the council was prepared to get things done and go through it. Um, other than I had minor difficulties getting here on time, thanks to... <laughs> 
things out of my control. Um, that happily, that was the biggest glitch, right? And usually that would not be the case. And so me being about four to seven minutes late was the biggest glitch in the whole budget process. So thanks to staff for getting that. I'm looking forward when we have public comment on that coming up soon and to hear um, thoughts August from- August 1st. Thank you, August, August 1st, say soon, August 1st, on, on what others have to say on that. But it was great. So I appreciate everyone um, that participated in that. We had, I think this was since we had our last council meeting. I get a little lost in all of it. But we had a nice luncheon with um, the University of Idaho folks, people from the city, uh, county people. Haley was there. I don't think I'm leaving any other one else out in the here. But it was really great to be able to yeah, get Art was there. Sorry. I'm, Art's just like everywhere. He's sort of like, you know, just a sidekick. I'm just so used to being there. I forget he's there. Um, which is a nice thing. I think that was a Thank compliment. You. Yes. Um, but it's really great to get together with all of those entities and just talk about, just take a minute and just kind of relax together and talk about how are things in your world? How are things in your world? My world's okay. Just get a sense of where everyone is. I, I appreciate those a lot. Um, Nothing earth shattering happened there, um, but it is really great to, to be able to get together and talk with everyone. And I, I'm i sure, gosh, it feels like there should be more, but I think there are other things that don't have to do with city business. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Maureen. Um, <clears throat> the two meetings that I was supposed to attend in the last time, uh, since the last meeting, um, both got canceled. One was during the week of July 4th, <laughs> and the other one was um, for failure to hit a qu quorum. And mm -hmm. so at that point, um, I'm hoping, we're hoping that they will get a corner at our next meeting in August. And nothing other than Parks and Rec next week. And it feels like I haven't been there in a long time because we were gone and then oh. somewhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, should be fun. Yeah, it's summertime and the living is easy. Uh. <laughs> Gina. I know that it always seems like all I talk about is the Tree Commission, but we had a Tree it. Commission yeah. meeting. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, we talked about the farmers. We, we manned, we treed the farmer's market table. Um, and we actually co-tabled co last week because it, there was a booking. I don't think it's an error whenever you, you have tree commission people with you, but that's what happened. And so we were at the farmer's market. Um, and it's funny in the summertime how you end up with one commission member available for that poor all-day Thing. So we also talked about um, Harvest Park. You know, that's our edible forest that we're putting in at the south uh, corner Next of Moscow. Station. Right, right, is it right across the street? Mm -hmm. Right across the street from the police station. And we talked about the Harvest Park uh, subcommittee and who those people were. And, and it was it was beautiful. You know, it's always I always kind of sweat the details about who gets assigned to these things, but it was very clear from the very beginning who these people should be. And, and it's kind of exciting because these are the true tree people. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's awesome. I didn't get to be on it, but I will be the cheerleader on the sideline. The best part of the whole meeting was that we started talking about um, the fall parks and rec, the brochure that comes out and the classes that the tree commission is offering. Do you guys know what tree cookies are? Yeah. I know. I know you need to sign up for the class. They're little slices of a, of a limb of a tree, right? So it's like a cross section. And, and the class is for little squabs, little, little kids to come in and, and paint little winter scenes or cool little Christmassy things and bring them home and put them on your tree. Oh my them. gosh, I have goosebumps thinking yeah. about it. Didn't you call it a so it's a tree oh, cookie. You don't I have to do cookies that. At cookie, you know, visual guys. Anyway, it's, it's really exciting. And it was fun because when we were trying to decide on this tree cookie thing, there were four or five other ideas, of really cool classes. We could talk about pruning and things like that. And oh, anyway, it, the rest of my two weeks was just a letdown. I didn't do anything else. I kind of cried because I wasn't at the tree commission. Really, there wasn't anything else. Julia. Julia. Well, I <laughs> I don't think I can talk it's as fast. It's hard to follow that. Right? I, I don't know if I can talk as fast as Gina, but I'll try really hard because it's already nine oh six. Um, let's see. I was at the farmers market table twice in July. Once for the Sustainable Environment Commission, where we handed out um, wildflower seeds, which was really fun, and those cute little bee houses that the FFA made. Um, and also, I was there for Fair and Affordable Housing, um, where we talked to people about that uh, serious issue in our community. 
I also had a fair and affordable housing meeting. And um, the big news from that meeting, the big reveal is that we started to look at the results of the survey that went out. Um, and the uh, two biggest bar barriers to housing in the area are, big surprise, the cost. And the second one is pet, rules about pets. Oh, no yeah. kidding. Oh, totally. But that was really interesting. It's, it's, a, very, it's, it's all a lot of parents. renters are not allowed to have pets. And so it makes it harder for them to find housing. Um, so those are my meetings. Haley, you're on. Uh, I had a smart transit meeting after our last uh, city council meeting, same boat today. Um, we are still hiring for an uh, executive director position and hiring for bus drivers. And yes. so we'll, a personnel committee, subcommittee will be meeting tomorrow um, to discuss. Um, we've got posters up and all that good stuff. Uh, Farmer's Market Commission was fun. Um, they've been evaluating the viability of creating some branded farmer's market swag to sell. Um, and uh, I was the lucky kid who got um, an apron that I get to wear every time I volunteer at the farmer's market. It's like super cool. So they're evaluating that. It sounds like um, those might be a, a bit too costly. So they're looking at maybe some tote bags. Everybody loves tote, good yeah, tote bag. Exactly. Um, so that's been super fun to watch uh, that conversation progress. Um, and then I had a planning and zoning meeting last week. Nils Pearson gave us an update on, and um, and I'll try to catch Matt as well. Uh, Nils is the executive director of a separate entity, the housing, the Affordable Housing Trust, which was spun off from the commission, given the limitations of what the commission can do as a city entity. And so um, Nils ha Nils ha works with a different budget. And has a, a wider scope of what he's able um, to do within within the operations of a trust. Um, and so we got. I have pages of notes from him. It was um, really interesting. He gave us an update on the partnership he's. Uh, they're working on with the um, architecture program at U of I. That they they have a plan for six years of being able to build one small. Um, I think it's three bed, one bath units on a plot of land and the students are doing the building. You can drive by They're They're doing all of the, the handiwork. Um, and it sounds like it's been, um, he kept saying a learning process, but I, um, I was, I ended the meeting feeling like I didn't knew that, know that I could find another reason to love this town. Um, but it's been really cool to see these partnerships come together. Um, and then, yep. Budget conversation was super duper. And, the only other thing I was going to make a plug for is on Wednesday, we've got the downtown streetscape. I want to make streetscape study first public comment period starts at 530. 530 to 7 here in the council chambers. So, um, and those public comment periods are only as good as what we hear from the public. So I hope you tell all your friends and bring them all out. So that's what I've got, I think. Okay. Okay, one more thing. I have one more thing about the Tree Commission. In your utility billing this month, you will get the Mature Tree Watering Guide. Oh, cool. So believe it or not, you have to water your grown-up trees too. So it's coming. It'll be along with your bill. Pay your bill. Read your, read your deal. Water your tree. Water, water your water tree. tree. Uh, for me, on the airport, uh, the construction on the terminal begins in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the dirt will stop moving. The funding is in place to accomplish a slightly scaled down version of what was originally contemplated. So right now it's uh, dirt's going to fly. The apron for parking the planes goes in, which consists of super duper deep concrete. So the planes don't sink into asphalt or sink into the concrete, which causes difficulties moving them later. Uh, also a giant tank for collection of de-icing fluid. And then it moves on. The Washington State regulation and not required by the FAA. There you go. Yeah. So I appreciate the clarification. It's, it's a really it's, expensive. It practice. only adds a couple or $3 million to the whole cost. But anyway, so and then it moves on into the underground luggage handling and TSA areas, getting that put up and then works up from there. Structural steel was ordered, should be on hand by October. And the thing had better be darn close to operation by December 31st, 2023, in order not to give money back to the federal government yeah. on that. 
So things are progressing on the airport. Looks good. I am beyond relieved, especially with that last allocation of $11.8 million in bill money that got us past the cost overruns due to construction. Yeah. And so that's what really put the period at the end of let's build. Uh, also had an interesting time a week ago with a group of religious scholars who came through town from Seattle University. They were from all over the place, uh, South Africa and Finland, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, uh, I think Colombia. Anyway, they came through with questions about how does government in the U.S. work with religions and religious freedoms, First Amendment rights and things like that. And for a lot of these people, this was a real education about our United States free-for-all where these rights are involved because most of their countries, it's a monolithic religion and very locked down. So they were really interested to hear what we have going on here in Moscow in the U.S., so were you a presenter? I was the only one. <laughs> oh, not even one. Yeah, so I, who knows what kind of falsitudes I might have perpetrated on them. No, okay. I, I wouldn't gonna, dare. We don't, we, we we don't think that's the case. Yard challenge. Oh, yeah. And also here in town, uh, Nathaniel Miller uh, has participated in the 50-yard challenge. And if you don't know what that is, it's where uh, kids, usually sub-18s, volunteer to mow 50 yards of people who can't mow their own yards across the course of a summer. And he completed 50 mowed yards, lickety split, and the organizer of this nationwide effort came through town and awarded him with a new mower, a leaf blower, and a string trimmer. The electric? Um, the string trimmer is, and the blower is. Yeah, the mower was the a mower is a uh, mower. It was beautiful. <laughs> So, but it's very pretty. Cool. So anyway, so he's going to carry on and do another 50 yards. So nice. kudos to Nathaniel yes, Miller Nathaniel. for his good works on that. So staff reports, anything good there? Nothing additional to report, Your Honor. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you could have created a fiction there. Too. I, I, had, I had a poem cooked up, but I just figured it's already late enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're at the end of the day, the end of the evening, and we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>